Are you glad to be in God's house? Come on, let's all be upstanding this morning. Let's stand up. Upstanding means stand up. Can we all stand up in God's presence this morning? Hallelujah. Can someone say, Hallelujah? Hallelujah. Praise God. God is good, amen. Yesterday we were ministering in Mecca. We came this time not from KL to Surabhat, but from Mecca to Surabhat. So, and uh, we had a wonderful service there. We do a, a few uh, sessions there every, every year in Mecca and get to see the different uh, moves of God and the way the Spirit of God is moving in different churches. And, and every time I come here, I I realize that there's a great uh, hunger for God's presence. Amen. And you need to keep it up. You need to allow God's Spirit to work in you. I'm praying that as usual, the messages will speak to your heart even this morning. But uh, it requires a heart that is open and fertile uh, for the Word of God to be sown into it. So this morning it's important for us to just reach out to God and even as we have done uh, a praise and worship, worship session and worshiping Him, we need to also ask the Holy Spirit to soften our hearts, to ask the rain of the Spirit to come over our lives so that the Word of God can be planted. Amen. How many of you want God's Word to be planted in your life? The Bible speaks about that in the book of James, that it is the implanted word that saves the soul. In other words, if we want change to happen in our lives, if we want God to really move and strengthen us in a powerful way through His word, then it has to be implanted. Uh, it's not just a word that is scattered and thrown. A lot of people just hear sermons. They, 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 you can hear sermons anywhere, even now in the YouTube. But if you want a real life transforming work of the Holy Spirit, then this is a good time where we can come together as a church and reach out to Him and ask the, the Holy Spirit to soften our hearts and uh, you know do a deep work in our lives so that the seed of God's Word can be implanted. Everyone say implanted. implanted. Amen. Praise God. Go ahead right now. Open up your mouths, your lips, and lift up your hands and ask God to just refresh you with His presence. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Father, this morning, we have come with an expectant heart. We have come, Lord God, to hear what you have to say. It's not just uh, teachings that are... Uh, that have been spoken every Sunday, but Lord, we want to hear your voice. We want to hear what you have to say. And thank you for SLA and the work that is done here to Dr. Kwan. And I pray, God, that you will continue to strengthen it, expand it, Lord God. And even this morning, we pray that this word will inspire them, Lord God, and cause them to move on and move ahead in the things that you have planned for them. So, Father, we just want to Thank you for all that you do in our midst even this morning. We trust that the Holy Spirit will work a powerful work in our, in our midst. In Jesus' name we pray. And God's people say, Amen. 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 You can be said. Hallelujah. Once again, it's a joy to be here, to be with Dr. Quan and the church. And uh, many of you I've seen quite often now, each time I come here, I see your faces. And it's a joy. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. Well, this morning I have a word that will inspire you. And uh, it's actually a series of teachings that I have developed. And, and from season to season, time to time, God inspires me to take messages to different places and to, to stress on certain things, the certain thoughts of God. So uh, I flow in the prophetic and I believe that uh, this is a very timely word that the body of Christ needs to hear. And that if you open up your hearts and listen and take on, take, take on, take in uh, the message, I believe that uh, you will also receive uh, from God and be, uh, be blessed this, this uh, morning. So, uh, let's first of all take a look in our Bibles in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 
First Corinthians chapter 10. I want to talk to you about the, the ways of God. The ways of God and how He how He leads us in life. Alright, so how do we know that the leadings of God over the children of Israel? The children of Israel. Uh, their story is found in the Old Testament. And God led them through Moses. Amen. Moses was the one, the prophet of God, that led the people of God out. Uh, and they were supposed to enter the promised land. But uh, it's very sad because that generation did not make it into the promised land. That generation died in the wilderness. And the Apostle Paul, in his writings, he gives us an understanding about the leadings of God through his people. The leadings of God through His people, and He gives us a very strong word here in verse 11. Let's turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 11. Speaking about the generation that came out with Moses, He said, Now all these things happen to them. Who is this them? Who is this them? So here to speak in church. Who is this them? The children of Israel. Amen. The people that came out with Moses. All these things happened to them. As examples. You know, we can learn from examples in life. You either be a good example or a bad example. And I'm praying that all of us are good examples. Amen. But even in through bad examples, we can learn in order not to make the same mistakes that they made. Right? So the children of Israel here, they were bad examples. They failed in the test that God led them to. You see, our, our lives is a journey. Okay? And the Apostle Paul says here that, that uh, these things happened to them as examples that they were written for our admonition. The word admonition here means it's instruction, it means warning, it means that we should take note of these things. Right? So they were written. As you go on reading from the beginning, you'll find that these people that God led through Moses they went to different locations and God led them. Who led them? God led them to different locations. But every time they came to those places, they failed the test. So this tells us what? The journey of life that God leads us through and leads us to certain points are a test. And one thing, one thing about the journey of God, the, the, the journey that God takes us through in life, when He leads us to certain places, He expects us to pass the test. So what happens if you fail the test? We sit again. Alright, so there are people who have gone through certain places in their lives. You see, the plan of God so none of us here, I pray, I'm sure, that none of us here would have come out from a certain country and go through wilderness, physically speaking, in order to go into the promised land. No, none of us, right? None of us will have to take the same places, the same spots that God will lead them through. None of us here will have to go through a wilderness, right? But nevertheless, the journey of God in our lives. God leads us to certain places to take a test. Now this test is basically to help us overcome the work of the flesh. Everyone say the work of the flesh. So as we know in the life of the children of Israel, they fail the test. 
So Paul the Apostle is now, many, many generations later, he's writing and he's saying that all these things happen to them as our example. Upon whom, the verse at the end says, upon whom the end of the ages have come. In other words, these things fill up the Bible space in the pages. We have Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. These books are recording the journeys of the children of Israel because they are lessons. <coughs> are you with me this morning? They are lessons for us. And it's wonderful to learn the significance of some of these places that they come to. So today I want to talk about one of them. But the children of Israel were led to several places over and over again. The places may be different, alright? Because they were journeying. The places may be different, but the test is the same. Why was it so? Because they failed the test. So I pray that as we learn these things, this morning, you'll understand that when God leads you to a certain place in your life, although we have become older, although we have grown older, although we have seen the same situation in our life before, but yet God leads us to certain places. Why? Simply because He wants you to overcome the flesh in that area. Are you with me this morning? Right? So we know this generation that came up with Moses for 40 years. For 40 years. Think about this. They did not learn the lesson. In fact, the Bible says in this passage, 1 Corinthians 10, that all of them God was not well pleased with. All of them did not make it into the promised land. Now what's the promised land? The promised land is our destiny. The promised land is the place where God has allocated for us. And we come to God's perfect will and we live in that place that God will abundantly supply for us. But all of us are in our, our journey. Each and every one of us are in our journey making it into the promised land. And God leads us to certain places so that we can overcome the flesh. So that more of Him and his ways are developed in us. Now I'm sure when I, talk, when I talk to you about these things, you'll realize that sometimes you come to a certain place in your life where it seems like a wall, it seems like a stencil, and you wonder, God, where are you in this situation in my life? What are you doing in this situation? See, the idea is that God wants you to overcome. Come on, say this together with me. God wants me to be an overcomer. Don't say like you are convinced about it. Say God, God wants, me wants me to be an overcomer. To be an overcomer. Yes, He wants you. When He takes you to a certain place, the things that bothered you 10 years ago, 20 years ago, should not be bothering you today because God has developed something in your life. Now, how many of us can say that? When God leads us to certain places, we wonder why is it that God is leading me to this place over and over again? It's because you have failed the test. Now, the children of Israel, I want to talk to you about one place today called Rephidim. Everyone say Rephidim. Now, Rephidim was known for a place where there was no water. So, of course, that was one of the greatest fears of the children of Israel. Why would God lead us or lead them to a place where there is no water in the wilderness? Where it was so necessary. It was so necessary for water, but they didn't have it. And this tells us something. Let's turn to the book of Exodus 17, where the story is. But this tells us that when God leads us in life, it is not always a place that is comfortable. It is not always a place that we like to go. When God leads you to join a certain company or to be in a place, let me tell you that sometimes these things may not be pleasing with your flesh. Alright? But yet God knows what He is doing. 
Come on, tell your neighbor that. Say, God knows what he's doing. God knows what he's doing. Alright. So notice in verse 1. Exodus 17, verse 1. So this is the foundation, this is the basis. Then all the congregation of the children of Israel set out on their journey from the wilderness of sin according, notice here, according to the commandment of the Lord. So the leadings of God over their lives were according to the commandment of the Lord. And to make it very visible, there was the pillar of cloud by day and there was the pillar of fire by night. Right? So how did the children of Israel know that it was God's command to go out to go to a certain place because they were led by the manifestations. So today, these manifestations are basically the work of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Where is the Holy Spirit today? Where is the Holy Spirit today? He is in us. The Holy Spirit is in us. The scripture says, the Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit. That's how He leads us. Many times, we don't have to look for a manifestation on the outside because we have the Holy Spirit. So the Old, Old Testament it was the signs of the, the cloud and the pillar, but the cloud and the fire. But we have it as a witness on the inside. So when God leads us in life, it is still the same Holy Spirit. Amen. It is the same Holy Spirit. And He leads us many times to places according to His commandment, like Rephidim. They camped in verse 1 in Rephidim. And what is attached to this phrase Rephidim? It says here, Rephidim, come on. What, what is in Rephidim? It's a place no water. No water. where there is no water. It's a place that is so contrary to what we think God would do. I guess that this is something that we can glean from, something that we can learn from. Now this is not the first time. So like I said earlier, the journeys of God are for our learning is so that we can overcome situations and things in our lives that bothered us in the past. So, one of the greatest fears that the children of Israel had was dying in the wilderness. So, they were, they, it, it could not compute in their mind, they, they couldn't understand why would God want to kill them now in the wilderness. He brought them out. <laughs> he brought them out of, of Egypt and now look where he has brought us to. So sometimes in our lives when he leads us, we go to a certain place to be attached to a certain, to a certain job or to do a certain ministry or whatever it is. We, we wonder God, why? Why did you why did you lead me in such a place? Why did you ask me to do such a thing? When you know, when you know the outcome, when you know that there's no water, when you know there's no provision. But you see, behind all of this, God wants us to learn something. And most of all, I want you to know something here. When God leads you to a certain place in your life, He wants you to know Him by revelation. He wants you to know Him. You see, when you get to know Him in that situation, you get to know yourself. Alright, so we are a reflection of God. And what He can do in that situation, and what, we are, what is expected of us in that situation. That's it. That's all about it. When God leads you to a certain place, He expects you to know Him. He wants you to know Him by revelation. And that's a reflection of who you are in that situation. And out of it will come for what He expects of you to do. So as we see in this story here, Rephidim was a place of failure. So although it's a place of failure for the children of Israel, it can be a place of success for us. Amen? Amen? Amen. That's what the Apostle Paul said. All these are written for us today for our admonition. They are written today so that we can learn not 
to make the same mistakes that they did. So as we go on reading in Exodus 17, they came to this place, Raphidim, it was a nice place. In fact, it was a plain, there was green grass, it was an open field, but yet Raphidim was known as a place where there is no water. No water. They were so angry with Moses as we go on reading. Let's, let's read some of these verses here. Verse 2. Therefore the people contended. Alright? In your Bible it says contended. Now what's that word contended? Contended means they were so angry. They were angry with God. They were angry with Moses. Contented means to fight. Now why would they come to such a state? It's because they were angry. They wanted to put up a fight against God, against Moses. You see, this is the work of the flesh. Amen. Every time God leads us into his destiny, into his will, the flesh will always contend. That's why in Galatians it says, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. So the whole idea about God's journeying in our lives, God leading us in this journey of life and leading us to certain destinations and places is so that God can have His way. So it's either in life you have your own way or God has His way. What would you like? God's ways. Hallelujah. Well, give yourself a clap of it. But let me warn you here. If you want God's way, then be prepared for hardship. Because not every place God leads us in life is going to be comfortable. The moment we feel the fire of it. Now what is this fire all about? It's called in the book of James, the testing of your faith. So you can live in the flesh or you can live by faith. If you want to be a man or a woman of faith, then be sure that there will be testing. And the testings are not comfortable. The testings are for you to endure. It's a place where you are very, very comfortable and you have done things in the past that created offense. Offense. So the people of God were offended. They were offended. They were contending with Moses. They said, Moses, we don't want this way. We don't want to live like this. We don't want to go the way that you are leading us. They contended. What, what, what did they really want? They wanted water. That's the surface. That's the, the physical need. But do you know that behind every physical need, there's a spiritual need? Amen. That's a spiritual need. So God brought them to Rephidim to tell them and to tell us today that your physical need does not solve the problem. Are you with me? Your physical need does not solve the problem. See, many of us, we may be going on in our lives for 10 years, for 15 years, for 20 years, but we are hitting the wall like Rafidim here. Although it's not a nice place actually, but they, they could not overcome this spot because always when they came to this place, they wanted that physical need to be met. They wanted that physical need to be met. So God has already the solution. God already has the answer. He already knew what He should do in this situation. So that's why this is a lesson for us. When you come to a place where you feel that your physical need has to be met, you must realize that God has a bigger plan. Amen. God has a bigger plan that He wants you to get involved with. It's not always our ways. It's not always what we want. Amen. Hallelujah. You see, the, the things that I'm sharing with you here are so vital, they are so important because this will carry on for many, many years to come. 
when you come to a spot like this, you must realize that there's a bigger thing that God wants to do in your life. It's not always meeting the physical thing. So you realize here that the people of Israel were asking for the wrong thing actually. Because would God create water in the wilderness? What's the answer? Yes, yes hallelujah. God will provide your physical need. The scripture says here that it was more than just it was more than just being dissatisfied. Go on reading here, we find in verse 2. They contended with Moses, they said, give us water. And then the second half says, Moses said to them, why do you contend with me? And what's the last phrase? Why do you tempt God? So what does this mean? It means that they were doubting whether God will provide their need. Where is God in all of this? You see, when we put it into our circumstances, we have done the same thing. We have done the same thing. When God brings you to a place where you, you may think that there is no provision, you may think that, where is God in this? Will he, will he work a miracle for me? Listen, they had seen miracles. Earlier on, when situations were so bad, in fact, they came out from a situation where God divided the Red Sea. Hallelujah. How many of us get to see this at least once in our lifetime? Did God ever divide the sea for you? Not really, right? Did you see the, the, the Klang River party? Or what river do we have here in Surabhan? Surabhan River. Did you see the Surabhan River party for you to go across the other side? No, right? But these people were so, I wouldn't say lucky, they were so blessed. Amen. To see the miracle, the handwork of God, the handiwork of God. They saw the, the Red Sea parting and they walked across the other side. Miracles so powerful. They worked these things. But listen, yet when they came to a place where there was no water, they questioned God. God, would you work this miracle for me? Would you work this sign for me? So they doubted whether God was present in your midst. Was present in your midst. Now, the Bible tells us that God was there. God was there. Let's turn to the book of Corinthians again. The book of Corinthians. 1 Corinthians 10. By the revelation of the Apostle Paul, it says in verse 4. Now this is the this is the incident in verse 4. Right? This is the same incident what happened in Raphidi. In verse 4, the Apostle Paul says, 1 Corinthians 10, And they all drank the same, what? Spiritual drink. For they drank of that spiritual rock that, flowed, that followed them, and that rock was Christ. You see, in their journeys, what they didn't see, what they didn't realize, was that there was the rock. Of course, the rock that Moses struck. Do you know the story here in What happened in Rapidim? In first, uh, in Exodus chapter 17, Moses went on before the people. The people were pressing on him. They wanted to kill him. But Moses went on before the people and God spoke to him to strike the rock. That's in first, uh, Exodus 17. And what happened? Water gushed out. Water gushed out abundantly. So Moses fed the people. The Apostle Paul says in verse 4, they all drank the same spiritual drink. But thank God for the New Testament. Amen. So we have the complete revelation of God. We have the Old Testament, we have the New Testament. The New Testament explains many things that happened in the Old Testament. And, and the people in the past could not see this, but yet we see today. Christians see today. What do we see? We see the revelation behind it. It was not just natural drink. It was not just water that they needed. Because God, by His wisdom, wanted to do a supernatural work to tell us today in our journeys of faith. Christians today can learn from what they didn't learn. In that today, 
when we come to a wall, when we come to a place where there is no breakthrough, no answer, we come to a place where we think with our natural mind that if we, if we only get this natural need met, then we will be satisfied. I tell you saints, that's not the solution. That's not the solution. That's why so many, there are so many people, have you noticed in the Bible, the book of Exodus, until the book of Deuteronomy, the Bible calls them children of Israel. Children of Israel. Why? Because they never grew. 40 years, can you imagine if you're 40 years old and your mother still has to give you formulated milk, put it in a bottle and feed you? Something is wrong, right? Now, in the spiritual sense, it's the same. Many of us don't mature. We don't grow up. We don't come out of certain circumstances. Why? Simply because we haven't learned the lessons. We come to certain places. God says, you fail. And you reset the exam again. You, you take up the exam again. You take up the test again. You didn't pass because you allowed the flesh to govern in that situation. So what we see here in this story, we find that the water that they actually drank was spiritual drink. In other words, today we realize this was a prophetic act. When Moses was commanded to strike the rock and water would gush out, Jesus was present. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Jesus was present. And Jesus said this when he was ministering on the earth. This is the work of God in our lives, in our journeys. In that He wants to baptize us with the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. Amen. Let's turn to John chapter 7. John chapter 7. The Gospel of John chapter 7. Let's pick up the story from verse 37. <laughs> On the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone, anyone thirst, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will what? Flow rivers of living water. Verse 39. But this he spoke concerning who? Concerning the Spirit whom those believing in him would receive. For the Holy Spirit was not given yet because Jesus was not glorified. Now, this refidim moment is a picture of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. Amen. Today we have the scriptures so wonderfully written for us. In that when we come to Raphidi, in a place where there is no water, in a place where we think that if we get our spirit physical need met, then that's the solution for it. The answer is wrong. The answer is that we must go to Jesus. Amen. We must not drink natural water, but spiritual water. Amen. We must drink of the Holy Spirit. So when you come to a pressing place in your life, when your flesh is crying out for something physical, you need to realize that the answer is found in Christ. The answer is found in Jesus. That if we will get His Holy Spirit in our lives then he will help us to navigate he will help us with the wisdom that he gives us you see your prayer for that circumstances will be different hallelujah amen your prayers will be different your actions will be different the way you respond to the situation will be different not in the flesh, but in the spirit. So the whole idea was basically God wanting to become more spiritual. And the only way to become more spiritual is to 
get the Holy Spirit in your life. Amen. And that's the revelation, people of God. Rephidim, as you go on reading in Exodus 17, do you know what it was known for? Rephidim, uh, that it was known as a place with no water, could have been turned into a place of spiritual experience. But do you know, the Bible says at the end of the story, verse 7, Exodus 7, they questioned God and said, Is God among us? And that place was known as Masa, not Masa, Masa and Meribah. What, is it, what does it mean? It simply means the place of strife, contention, and a place of testing. God, are you here? Isn't it sad? God worked a miracle. I mean, how often do we see water come out from a rock? And no time at all for many of us. But listen. Yet that miracle happened, yet God fed them. But the ending of that story is simply, Where are you, God? Where are you, God? When a place where God could have manifested Himself and be known as a place of the spiritual breakthrough and miracle, God was forgotten. So I pray as we learn from these examples that we will not make the same mistake. Amen. We will not be repeating the same things in that when God brings us to a place where we do not understand His leadings, we do not know why does God tell us to do certain things. We come to a place that is biblical. Now this is very important. It's the time for you not to question God. It's a time for you not to ask God, why are you doing these things to me? It's a time for you to draw close to God. To be filled with the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. To ask the presence of God to fill you and say, God, I need you in this circumstance. I need you more in my life. Hallelujah. Amen? You see, if only the Christians, if only Christians will learn these things, we will realize that God would take us further and further in His will. Further and further in His will. How many of you want to go further and further in His will? Hallelujah. You see, God's plan for each and every one of us is wonderful. God has great things for us, but many of us don't accomplish some of these things because we have to receive the test. Receive some of these things. The work of the flesh got in between. The work of the flesh got the better of us. And we couldn't break through. We couldn't move on to the further things and the further plans that God has for us. So I pray that at least we get one of these things right. We come to Raphidim and we come to Jesus. Amen. We come to ask Him to fill us with the Holy Spirit. Come on, this morning let's all be outstanding. Let's stand up this morning. I know many of us may be going through some situations that are Pressing, that are difficult. Some of us are in a place where we are needing God's immediate attention, God's answers. We need the anointing for healing, probably. We need something physically done. But yet, the answer is always the same Jesus, come and fill me with your Holy Spirit. Because within us, there is a greater need. The greatest need in our life is not a physical need. The greatest need in our lives is a spiritual need. And that need is simply to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Because when you are filled with the Holy Spirit, you have contentment. Contentment means satisfaction. And you realize that God is with you. And if God is with you, you realize that you're going to come out from this situation. Amen. You're going to come out from your problems. Amen? Amen? You're going to come out from this difficulty that you're facing. Because God will give you the wisdom. Amen. You know that 1 Corinthians chapter 10 tells us in verse 13 that every test that we go through, God has a way of escape. 
Amen. God has a way of escape. Maybe you can put it on the screen. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. There's no test that you can go through in life. You may think that God led you to a certain place and it's so difficult, but I want you to know the first Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13 says, God is faithful. Amen. And God is faithful in that He will make a way of escape. He will make a way of escape. There's always a way out. Come on, tell your neighbor that. There's always a way out. <laughs> no matter how difficult it is. Come on, say, no matter how difficult it is, no matter how pressing it is, there's a way out. The Holy Spirit will lead me out of this mess. Hallelujah. Amen. When you come to rest with him, remember, he wants you to be filled with his presence. Don't question God. Don't question God. Don't question why you are in that state. Why did you come to this place? But realize that God has another step for you to take. And every time you, you, you come through that way that God leads you out, you come to a higher level. Hallelujah. It's a pass. It's a pass. And then God rewards you. Amen. Amen. God rewards you. He takes you up. He increases you. He blesses you. And He takes you further in His way. Hallelujah. Not the song that you sang, Take Me Deeper. And I was wondering, what does the song sing for this time of ministry? And Brother got it right. Take me deeper. Take me deeper. So we're going to sing this song. Where's the rest of them? Guitarist, probably. This should be the longing of our hearts, the longing of our souls. We need the Holy Spirit. Amen. We need to drink from the waters that Jesus can provide, the Holy Spirit, so that we can be filled and we can be strengthened in our crisis.